Hi, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to Infinite Learning's webinar today. Uh, we're delighted to be running this webinar in partnership with uh, Russell Earnshaw, or Rusty to some of you perhaps, and Jason Duffy from Sedba School in the UK. Um, the focus of today's webinar really is around rugby, yes, but perhaps more generically around sporting, uh, coaching and sport, and creating um, that learning environment within a sporting context. Um, Rusty today, uh, in partnership with Jason, they're going to focus on how to beat the game. So focusing on developing players, and what does that mean for coaches and for teachers? They're going to consider the talent bubble and, and sharing information on what is talent and how do we identify, select, develop and confirm it. And they're going to consider coaching craft. What are the skills that are going to be helpful to supporting and challenging players? Now, before I hand over to Russell and Jason, um, from our perspective of just a housekeeping uh, uh, guidelines, really, um, at the moment you're all on mute, but we're actually quite a nice small group. So as we go through the webinar, we'll probably unmute you so we can actually have an open live question and answer session and you can really benefit from putting those important questions to Russell and to Jason. There's also a chat box so you can actually write questions as well if you prefer, and we can come back to those as a group in a live Q&A um, at the end. Uh, other questions that often come up, will we get a certificate? Will there be a recording of the session? Uh, yes and yes. Um, so we'll share that. That will come to you tomorrow um, around about five o'clock. Uh, and we'll also issue an email soon after the webinar with a, a PDF copy of the PowerPoint that's being used today. So do enjoy uh, and, and do ask questions. Um, just chatting to Rusty and Jason beforehand. Um, and they're both very keen that this be as interactive as possible. So, so don't be shy, ask your questions. Um, and I'm going to actually ask Jason if he would please introduce uh, Rusty on our behalf, because he knows him far better than we do. Uh, and so time to embarrass Rusty a little bit with his uh, rather impressive bio. Jason, over to you. Thanks, Rebecca. And yeah, Rusty, just before we go into sort of embarrassing you a little bit, why didn't you give me the heads up on the Batman t-shirt? I could have had my Robin on. <laughs> birthday presents from my kids. They know you very well. Nice. They know they know you very well. And then something, Rebecca, that just occurred to me before, um, as you were speaking, was I wondered whether we could have used the excuse of work to do this live from Dubai. So whether yeah, we could have come across, you know. If only. Well, that's the, that's the that's the plan, isn't it? But it's a bit of a, a long term one, and unfortunately, uh, at the moment. Looking out my office window, rain crashing against the window, wind nice and cool. We could have been out in the sun. It's a, it's a glorious day here in Dubai, I have to admit. Sorry. <laughs> thanks, thanks I cannot lie. Yeah. <laughs> Rusty, we'll get going. We've been doing some work over the last few years, so we've got to know each other quite well. And um, I know this will be the, the bit that you least look forward to. But just for those of you that don't know Russell or a bit of a background on, on sort of him as a, a performer, and uh, well, a performer in both as a player and a coach, but I think you've won the Heineken Cup for Bath, you've represented England Sevens, you've coached England Sevens, you've won Dubai titles, you won the first New Zealand title with the England team in Wellington, I think. Um, so, why coaching? Why did you go from playing into coaching? Uh, well, th thanks for having me, and uh, yeah, I hope everyone's safe and well. It's definitely I would definitely prefer to be in Dubai from a temperature and a global pandemic point of view at this moment in time, quite frankly. So you're very lucky. Um, I, I mean, I guess it's um, no plan. Uh, it's easy to connect the dots of backwards and go, oh, this was a calling or there was a plan, but there wasn't. Someone got sacked. Uh, they said, would you do it? And I thought, you know, I'm getting on a bit now. I might have to think about what I do next. So. Um, yeah, I was. I guess I was. I was very fortunate at that moment in time. Uh, good stuff. And then we've we've put on our website for you the 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 courses for us. But someone, uh, I think from Google, wrote that you were like the the maniac in the room, the crazy one in the room. What what sort of warrants that? Um, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's a good question. Actually, I, I'm doing a bit of stuff with England, the England coaches at the moment, and and Eddie said, "Oh, what do you think makes you unique?" and um, we don't share this copy too widely. And I said, oh, what do you think makes me unique? And that was one of the things he spoke about was um, like almost willing to break the rules a little bit. I think there's a lot of stuff that we think is tradition. Uh, often the people, there's people who aren't even in the room, like, you know, 
Maureen from accounts wouldn't like that and she's not even in the room and we're adhering to some imaginary traditions. I think we'll look in the future. And a great example is, so my teenage son, he just doesn't perform really well in the morning, quite frankly, and yet most of his lessons are in the morning. So, um, I, and, and another one that was quite interesting, when we went over to, um, did a bit of stuff in Malaysia and uh, they said, oh, all our fixtures keep getting, you know, everything gets called off because of the rain and the thunder in the afternoon. I was, oh, have you ever thought of doing games in the morning? <laughs> I, oh, no, no, but we do it in the afternoon. Time. Well, maybe with a, you know, kids would be more excited about coming to school. Maybe they'd burn a bit of energy and be better behaved in the afternoon. And maybe you'd have more fixtures on because of lack of lightning. So I guess not to be obstructive, but I just think generally like that nudge towards a bit of disruption and fresh thinking can be helpful for schools, coaches, organisations, people. So I'm, I guess I'm, I'm willing to do it. And now that I'm self-employed, it's a lot easier. <laughs> we'll talk, no, we won't go backwards, we'll only move forwards. And then, mate, just, just putting that into some sort of perspective, though, because you are sort of, you, you can be classed, we're speaking to a lot of schools, a lot of clubs where tradition is actually really important. So how do you sort of um, get the balance? I mean, is it a simple equation or is it a bit more complex? Uh, it's never a simple equation, is it? But I think understanding where people are would be a really important part of coaching. So what's the stuff that came before? Um, I would recommend listening to Owen Eastwood. He's just done a brilliant podcast uh, with uh, uh, Michael Gervais, Finding Mastery. You know, what's the stuff that came before? What's the highs? What's the low? What's our biography as coaches, as organisations? And, you know, what do we stand for? What makes us unique? Um, and then, yeah, where are we going? For me, it's more about where are we going? And let's take the good stuff. Let's look at our identity and what we stand for. But let's also be prepared for, I mean, who'd have thought, like, we would be doing this from live from our freezing cold living rooms. <laughs> to Dubai. Um, the global pandemic is the ultimate disruption to how we think about, you know, you know, so many traditions have been broken in the last 10 months and they've had to be. And the people that are thriving at the moment are the ones that have adapted or predicted it. So I work for a business, uh, TG. Uh, we got our Zoom licenses in December 2019. Um, and we had already divided people up into teams that weren't able to mix before COVID even arrived in the UK. So, and they're killing it this year because we were we were thinking differently about how stuff was going to have to be done. Yeah, it's probably important though because everyone's busy. So we're talking about teachers, we're talking about volunteers in in a club game. People are busy, and it's something I struggle with is prioritising some time in your week uh, to to do that, to, to look at where you can be different, look at how you can connect with different people or approach things slightly uh, ununiformed as, as normal. Yeah, and, 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 and look, it's clearly, I'm very fortunate that my life is now just being immersed in this. I speak to lots of coaches and I call it like the midlife crisis. They get to my age and they realize that, you know, there's less years left on the clock and they wanna, they get real, um, like joy from their coaching and so they want to get into it more some of them have kind of split their work so they're doing a bit of coaching and a bit of work now and and these aren't people that are rich so i'm talking about people that want to maximize enjoyment from their life what i would always say to any coach really and, and same with the england coaches like well what are you going to do in today's session for you to get better as well so what's the one or two percent for you so if we every time we coach, and I get that the majority of coaches might do 30, 40 hours coaching a year and probably struggle around, you know, time for to, to develop themselves. But just having one little focus in a session and you might set that or the players might set it or your co-coaches might set it, then, you know, I think that's that's going to be helpful for the, for the players in the long run. Mate, I think that's one big area where every single coach could get better at is what about me? How do I get better? What are the things I'm looking for? And that's definitely something I've picked up from working with, with you guys. And I just need to, to get myself in gear and do that a bit better as well and continue to get better. Uh, it, would be a, it would be a column in the session plan for me. So I think of coaching as like you, you control practice design, your behaviours, 
then your kind of co-coaching team, how you interact. And then ultimately it's about your interactions with the players. But the column on what are we doing as coaches? So if I give you a real life example, uh, uh, don't spread this one on social media, but we played it out with England. So I went in in so the end of September before the Nations Cup stuff and the coaches set each other challenges and we played a day out where Eddie Jones had imaginary COVID because one of the questions they wanted to explore was, what if Eddie has COVID? And that's a perfectly reasonable thing to do in a performance environment. What if the main man gets COVID? What would we do? Well, let's at least have a day where we practiced it. You and I could just go on and on and on and talk, and I'm conscious about that for, for both of us. But the last question I want to I want to ask you before you kick into some of these slides is around influence and greatest influence uh, for you. So who are the people that sort of have given you greatest sort of inspiration and influence in your coaching career? Uh, probably like the players. Um, so I played in the forwards and I coached the backs with England. So when you've got to coach players who are way more skillful than you, like, you know, a Tom Curtis or a Cam Redpath or a Mark Smith, or a, then you've probably got to be um, comfortable being vulnerable and humble and realising you don't know it all. Uh, having kids myself is, I'm not saying, I'm saying all coaches should have kids. I'm not, but I would recommend it. Um, and then, you know, people like John Fletcher, Peter Walton, Kevin Barry, Nigel Redman. I mean, I think that, maybe something to consider for yourself as a coach or a teacher or a leader is like, what's my network? And it's a question I'll ask a lot is like, what's my empty chair? So if I was out coaching on my own, what, what would be missing? So, and how am I developing that? So just having some people in that network as well, that maybe don't think quite like you think, and it doesn't become an echo chamber. Okay. Class. Listen, you fly, you fly on now with these. I'll pick up some stuff and, and interact with you. And if there's well, any I questions in the you have switched ones you today? Which one yeah, I looked at this before. I'm probably number two today. Oh, like smug? No, I don't mean smug, just happy. Uh, yeah, look, I'm, I, I think oh, it's which one are you? Oh, mate. Well, I, I, had a, I had a two and a half hour bath this morning doing admin from six o'clock in the morning. So I'm probably number four, quite frankly. I'm not. <laughs> um, I'll be, uh, when I've done my last podcast at nine o'clock tonight, uh, I'll be number nine um, or five. Um, yeah, I just think this is useful. I'm clearly, as a coach or as a teacher or whatever, your function, like just checking in with people and seeing where they are is critical for me. Because um, we can, of course, adapt sessions and lessons based upon this if we think it's the right thing to do. Uh, they don't let the people in the, really expensive jets that cost a lot of money to test fly if they're not if they if they say they're feeling like four or five they probably need to be feeling like nine so um yeah something to consider and then yeah look i think this is useful just for kind of for me to to share where i am in terms of my coaching um um which two or three are you interested in Duff's out of interest um uh, just for me, I think it is the bus stop, and I think it is the um, Chicago Bulls picture. Cool. So bus stop, I think we referenced it before, you know, meet people where they are. So I'm doing a bit of work in football at the moment. We always start with their current session plan. With England, we did a, one of the questions was, um, if you could add two things and take one thing away from the session plan, what would they be? So I'm meeting people where they are. And what's your current understanding? How do you currently plan? What could we add to it? What would we take away? And and let's move from that point. All too often, in my opinion, we're we're often way too far away from people, and I can be really guilty of that. My my bias is towards stretching people, or we can be making it too easy for people, and we we then look at people and we mistake that for their lack of concentration, or they're not that really into it. And I'm thinking maybe we should look at. Whether we've uh, whether we've worked out which bus stop they're at, um, the other one, yeah. So I just think there's a <clears throat> all of this really would probably be captured by the bottom left. Is I think there's a few kind of super coaches on the planet, and I think they could coach multiple sports, and they could coach in multiple environments, and they could get the best out of people, and they could <clears throat> understand what came before. 
um, and I'm assuming we all watched the documentary. It was kind of the start of lockdown for many of us. And so, yeah, I just think that's a good example. Uh, if I give a couple more that <clears throat> I think are relevant and I'm sure we'll talk about today. <clears throat> Sorry, for me, coaching is about them opening the front door, not me breaking in around the back. Um, I want to understand what helps people be their best and what makes them wobble. Top right, uh, I, I, I've shown this for a couple of years now and said, oh, Matt Turner, I never really worked out how to coach him. I think my job is to work out how to coach people. And to be fair, I got to coach him in Bermuda at the end of last year, and uh, I finally worked it out. It only took uh, eight years of my life. <clears throat> and then the last thing is just a note from a, a girl I taught economics to, and I just I just think it's a long game thing, this. Um, I, I would recommend Doug Lemov's book, Coach's Guide to Teaching. I think it's a, a brilliant book, and Dan Abraham's podcast with him is excellent. And one of the things he talks about is in sport, we're often think in terms of weeks, and it's not that helpful because actually learning doesn't happen in a week. So if you were to think in your club, you know, four or five years down the line, where can this person be? What bus stop are they now? What's the next bus stop? I think that's a helpful mindset. So <clears throat> top left, sorry. I think our job is to set problems, not give solutions. So so brain dump, brain dump. Um, I'll just kind of, and I don't know whether people want to kind of put in the chat box what they think of this, but I'll just play this and hopefully people can can hear it. So um, I'm, I'm, I'm definitely curious as to kind of, and feel free to answer Dove, so if anyone else wants to unmute or, or, or put something in the chat box, I'm, what they think that is for starters, and, you know, how's it making you feel? And yeah, I'm just curious what, what, where people are at with it. They draw me to kick off. Uh, and by the way, everyone else, feel free to to unmute. I don't know if people can unmute themselves or they want to put some stuff in the chat box. And Rebecca, uh, you want to unmute them for us? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm going to I'm, I'm going to go in now. And um... actually, I'm going to ask you, Rebecca. Rebecca, what are you what are you noticing from that? What's the what do you think uh, is going? On? The vid the video there. Yeah, the video. Um. I, I just sort of saw camaraderie. I saw them coming together as a team in a really fun, positive way, and 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 not just it's sort of in a coordinated way, almost like you know clockwork workings together of a of a team, um, but with fun and passion and humour. Yeah, I mean one of the <clears throat> so if you listen to. Oh, hold on. Not sure what I've done. Hold on a minute. No, he's back on now. He's back on. You're good. Um, <laughs> yeah, look, one of the most powerful things we can do as humans is connect and sing together. It actually releases lots of <clears throat> really powerful uh, painkillers and some of the nicer stuff as well that will prepare us to <clears throat> to do what these fellas are about to do. So often people think this is just post-match type thing, but this is before the this is before a final in um, in Las Vegas. Um, anything else people were thinking or noticing? Yeah, 
Rush, did you want to just talk a bit more about that on your sort of um, your Bermuda stuff, on the ten stuff around the singing and how oh, that developed? Yeah, yeah. So, and look, this is <clears throat> this is pre-match, and I guess my question to most people is, and I was definitely in a lot of changing rooms that weren't helping me be my best on the pitch before the game. So I would <clears throat> be thinking about that wasn't a good environment for me to be my best. And yeah, I coached a team in, in Bermuda and lots of people from all over the place, um, <clears throat> definitely some Pacific Island influence. And I've never sang that much in my life. Um, like before training, during training, <clears throat> after training, before matches, it was... It was like, that was incredible, really. Um, <clears throat> and people think this isn't performance sometimes. So New Zealand Sevens, who've just won the last couple of World Series, I think, uh, I asked their analyst, what's the best thing about the New Zealand Sevens programme? And he said, um, the singing. Um, so, <clears throat> and once again, this isn't, I'm not saying go out and sing and you're going to win the World Series. What I am saying is like, <clears throat> How aware are you of the best environment for the people, the people in your environment? So, um, and for me, that would involve understanding where they are. It'll probably involve a high amount of choice and co-creation. And so here's some examples from my world, really. This is <clears throat> Marcus Street, who plays for Exeter. Um, at that age, he's 17. He's got a good beard, especially considering he's born in August. And that's a one-on-one -on -one meeting. That's a one-on-one -on -one meeting. Not face-to-face -face would be something that <clears throat> I would be considering with young people, you know, making it playful. Where this is a bit like back in the day with maybe pint glasses or condiments. Same again around a Sabutio table. That is a, that is a meeting. <clears throat> and maybe something to consider is like, where do you do your best thinking? Um, for me, it's, well, it's in the bath, quite frankly. Um, or it's in the car. Uh, I'm not getting so much time in the car at the moment, so I'm definitely spending more time in the bath. Uh, where's it for you, Duffs? Where do you do your best thinking? In the car, yeah, in the car. But I tend to get a bit too deep in mine. I'm, I'm very emotive in, in my sort of thinking time. So I, it's uh, it's definitely the car. But then what I've got from, uh, from you, Fletcher, is that just take one hour out a day or one hour a week to just think about some stuff in some certain areas and and that's what I think that I was alluding to earlier on was having that sort of individual time me time to to think about what really matters what I really need and and how am I really going to develop and move forward but I'm yeah. up and down the M6 so the car the car for me would be natural yeah and look it's something to consider and how much time you're creating for yourself and also for others so don't just drop something on someone I mean the flipped classroom type stuff would would make sense from this point of view. You know, people have time. For some people, it might be in the morning. Some people, it might be in the evening. Um, and exactly what you said there. I mean, just create time to think. I can often be like a really busy fool, and I'm just busy being busy and actually creating time to go and walk or to you know, whatever it might be is is really helpful for me. So, <clears throat> I guess my question for you all to consider is like, how do you know you create a really good environment? And and, and I guess how how co-created is it? Um, <clears throat> next thing, which I think we'll explore over the course, is like, is this stuff? And apologies, it looks quite busy, but for me, this is this is coaching. So, top left, you have choice around your practice design. Um, bottom left, you have choice around your behaviours. And apologies, this is football. They do have under ten goalkeepers, which is mind blowing. Um, when we talk about talent, we can definitely get into this. And so some of the behaviour stuff is like, who did you speak to the most? Who did you speak to the least? Who did you interact with? Did you interact with an individual, a small group, a whole group? How much was ball rolling? All this type of stuff. So for me as a coach, I'd be thinking, when am I silent? When am I not silent? Why? A great question to consider is like, what was my next choice? So... I was at a, a session recently and one of the players had a go at another player and I said, oh, when you had a go at that player, what um, what was your second choice? And he said, what do you mean? I said, well, when you had a go at him in front of all his mates um, and he's quite new to this club, um, what was your second choice? He said, oh, no, no, that's how we do things around here. We have a go at people when they do stuff wrong. I mean, I'm, 
you, know, you might want to go and have a conversation or think about the other stuff. And it was one of the questions we talked about with the England coaches was, give me an example today of when you chose to do something, but tell me about the alternative you chose not to do. So if we want to be critical coaches, we've got to be really mindful of this. So that might be where are you standing and why. I work in lots of sports and I can tell you where people will stand. So hockey coaches, often referees. Football coaches, um, often feeders. Uh, if you're an outfield coach, you rarely stand with goalkeepers. Uh, if you're a rugby coach, you'll generally look at the ball. Um, you won't look at off the ball. And then, and then this stuff for me is kind of your skills as a coach. And there's yeah, lots of things there that I think would be really helpful to support players with their learning. So I don't know whether people are curious about some and they want to put them in the chat box or they want to unmute and. Which ones are you curious about? Or do you want to pick a couple out? Um, yeah, well, I was going to ask you, Rusty. I was going to ask you if you had to if you had to prioritise uh, two or three skills as a coach. You know, which ones would you be leaning towards more than the others? Um, peer to peer. Um, if you're coaching uh, kids, and I'm sure people have read like Sarah Jane Blakemore's book and seen her TED talk, then you would understand how powerful peer to peer is, and so not thinking of ourselves as one coach but if there's 20 kids there then there's a, possibly 21 coaches like so you know everyone i want to i want you to tell Duff's what he's done well uh, maybe a secret mission with the best players so when you're coaching marcus marcus smith tom curry then actually them them giving positive feedback to other people is really powerful so peer to peer um replay loads because do you want to have another go at that is is powerful and now that's if something doesn't go so well, you might go, look, do you want to have another go? Should we replay it? Or you might go, actually, you did that really well. Should we make it a bit harder and do you want to replay it? So should we put another defender in? Um, and then probably, oh, man, this is tough to pick three. Um, I'm going to go for, I'm going to pick two more. I'm going to go for pause. So the thing that's changed the most in my coaching, and it's tied in with, with metacognition on the top right there is is the players pausing the session. So them being the calling the timeouts as opposed to me, which is a complete flip of what it used to be. And um, if we want to create problem solving players, then well, I'm, I'm telling you now, we shouldn't be the ones calling the huddles the majority of the time. They should be. And then top right, second ball. So how can I be really intentional around ignore that ball, introduce a second one to maybe give people more touches to shape some stuff that we've talked about and see if it happens to um, to create different scenarios. So, yeah, sorry, Matt, I'm picking four. If you could pick one, which one would you pick? I think we might have lost him, Rusty, for a second. I think someone, something's, something or someone has, has dragged him away. Sebra Wi-Fi, Sebra Wi-Fi. Um, Guys, um, you're all now, um, I see some of you have self-muted, which is great, so we don't get the feedback, but if you do have any questions, um, please don't be shy. We're, we're a small um, group, there's only, there's only 10 of you as attendees, and, and just Rusty and Jason here, and they're really nice and friendly, they're not scary at all. Um, yeah, I, hope, so I do, hope everyone saw my daughter there, we're homeschooling. She, yes, she <laughs> did, we did. She'd come and said hello, oh man. It was all, all all taken care of. This hour was protected and she's escaped. She's beat <laughs> the game. She got over the baby gate. <clears throat> oh, classic. We've all been there, Jason. It's sign of the times, actually. And it's a, it's <laughs> no not a bad thing. So any any questions? As I say, if you prefer, you can use the chat box as well to type in any questions. Um, I think uh, Rusty <laughs> just posed a question to you, Jason. Which which of those areas was most important to you? Yeah, I, I don't... I don't I'd already anticipated. I knew it was coming my way. I'd be slightly different. You can only have one. You can only have one. Yeah, it would be really simple for me, and I would go on noticing. So I would notice stuff. So I'd, I'd spend a lot of time not watching the ball. I'd spend a lot of time off pitch, on pitch, just picking up some stuff, and I'd be having lots of conversations around uh, rugby-related, non-rugby-related stuff, and, and just notice stuff about individuals and collectively as well as the team. So that would be my most important coaching skill. I mean, you can't do anything else without noticing. Well, actually, most important playing skill as well. You can't do anything without scanning. So 
unless we're, if we're not coaching scanning, then in my opinion, we're not coaching. Uh, we're not coaching decision making or or, or, or tactical. You know, play the game. I think. Yeah, that would lend itself to me though as a player, Rusty. So you, you would know through many uh, jokes around me as a player would be that I wasn't the very quickest on my feet, but actually my brain and I had to think a lot quicker than others just because I needed to get off the mark quicker. So um, that lends itself travelled with me from my playing to, to coaching. Yeah, cool. As if anyone's got any questions, definitely just ask them. Um, so I'll, if I just kind of, yeah, and then the other stuff is talent, really. So, I mean, we were just chatting about this earlier, Duff. So this video is quite a famous video of this young kid running over everyone. And, and I hear the word talent a lot. And and, and, and I guess it's just to, just to consider what it is and what it isn't. And, 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 and also, like, I mean, for example, this kid... I mean, my view is in lots of our um, places where talent has been developed, or I mean, everyone has talent, quite frankly. Um, then we're not straight, we're not doing the right thing for this kid at the moment, in my opinion. So this kid is currently carrying the ball in one hand. Is he spent most of his time with his head down because he doesn't need to pass to anyone. His teammates don't support him, and he's never needed to kick. He's probably putting a few kids off rugby and injuring some in the process. And in my opinion, that is a really poor example of how you develop talent. At some point, this kid will drop out of the game if he's not given the skills he's going to eventually need in the game. And so <clears throat> I kind of this would be how we would talk about it. It's kind of that sweet spot around genetics. So certainly in, in, in rugby, as an example, yeah. You're going to have to be have something that that helps you there. I'm not saying you have to be gigantic because Harry Randall and Marcus Smith are ripping up in the Premiership, and there Harry's about 71 and Marcus is about 70, 70 late 70s kilograms. Um, they both have unbelievable competitive mindset and the ability to to stay in the moment and not be frustrated. And part of that's come from their upbringing and, you know, actually being a little kid for a long period of time and having to deal with that and coming up with some solutions. And then your training environment is critical. In my opinion, this kid isn't in a, in a, in a helpful training environment for him at the moment. And then I, I just put that down on the bottom, and I'm sure it's something we can explore at a later date, is this was really impactful for us as a pathway was to go, look, what do we think are the priority skills for young players that we hope will go and play 50 plus caps for England. So, you know, the, the Tom Curry's of this world. Um, and that was creativity, so that's solutions to problems. So this kid isn't that creative at the moment. Uh, he doesn't need to pass, he doesn't need to kick. He's not developing those skills. Um, awareness, which is, I guess, what we just talked about, which is your ability to kind of gather information. Uh, resilience, how you deal with pressure, and for me that's individual and it's contextual. Um, for some people it's about, um, you know, they might struggle to play in front of big crowds. Some people love it. Some people come alive. Some people struggle. Those same people who come alive then might struggle when they're injured. So um, I just like kind of finding out what makes people wobble. I think that's a helpful question and then coming up with some solutions. Um, Decision making and self organizing. Self organizing being actually can the players organize themselves to solve problems? And I think a lot of stuff we do as coaches gets in the way of that. So, us calling huddles, um, us organizing the practices um, as opposed to co creating them, us kind of telling people what we've seen as opposed to asking questions like, what have you seen? And Doug Lennon's book talks about that. I think it's a great question for all coaches to ask instead of just jumping in on, you know, that's a poor decision or blah, blah, you know. What did you see? Because if they haven't seen what you've seen, and quite frankly, you know, that lots of players that we coach, are, it, I think it's helpful for us as coaches to go and experience learning something new again because you don't, you don't see what you You've got to understand what those people have seen. So, Rusty, just let me 
Yeah, but, let me just jump in on some stuff there that, that you were talking about because I think we all experience it within our coaching. We we often have a really, really big kid. We often have a really, really small kid. That's what the beauty of our game is that it's inclusive, right? Uh, we'll often have really super talented players, whether they be big or small, and players that need sort of some development. I love the word you use, and it, it would be wobble. So, you know, what makes them wobble? And then straight away, as soon as that comes into my head, it's around stretch and support. But for me, it's the real understanding of the support bit. So absolute clarity in uh, coach to, to player around about this is how I'm going to stretch you. This is how I'm going to make you better. Think about some of the stuff and I'm going to support you along the way. So we do want to make them wobble, but the support aspect of all of that is vital, right? Yeah, I mean, there's some unhelpful language. So there's a quite a famous paper that I'm sure people have seen called Talent Needs Trauma. And trauma is, you know, is a medical word for what it is. However, it also needs really to be really well supported. So if I, if this kid, for example, if I said you're playing this game and if anyone touches you, it's a turnover, then that would 100% make him wobble. So I need to work out what's the right challenge for him, which bus stop's he at, what's the right challenge, and then how do we support him? So what's quite, I tend to go for, look, every time you're quite frustrated, maybe if you just smiled, and I'll keep a record of how many smiles, because smiling releases all the good stuff in your body. And I tend to use that with the kids quite a lot to to broach the subject initially. So what would be a good challenge? Look, I've noticed this. What do you think? You know, or, or if they're struggling to go, look, we could play this. We could play um, one touch turnover or we could play two touch turnover. Which one, which one do you feel comfortable with? And then how can I support you? And what I've heard is that if you smile and maybe I'll just keep a record of how many times you smile at me. Um, so, yeah, the, as you said, that support is critical. And by the way, it then comes back down to the individual at the centre of what we're doing. So, you know, you know as well as I do that, you know, the big schools of the UAE, the big schools of the UK, it's often when you get towards the top, it's around about performance uh, and it's more sort of collective than individual. But coaching in its purest form, would you agree or disagree is around about the development of an individual? Oh, mate. I mean, that's, that's all it is, really. I, I, I'm, I'm only thinking of them in 30, 40 years' time, quite frankly. I'm not thinking of, like, is this person going to win the Premiership this year? I'm thinking of, in 30 years' time, are they going to be happy with their life? Are they going to come across and say hi to me if I'm still alive at that stage? Um, and I was curious about, like, so from a Sebba point of view, you know, so if I think of some of your players like you know, Tom Curtis, Rob Farah, people like that who are playing in the Premiership now, like, would those players have been the big kid when they were younger? Did they have some struggle? Um, yeah, you would you would know this better than me. I know from the players I've coached, so like Marcus, Harry Randall, people like that, that they had yes. loads of struggle. So it's really interesting. There's Josh Hodge, who is, uh, went from Newcastle to Exeter, England 20s. Um, it's stick thin, really small kid, quite fast. Loved football, sort of like rugby, um, but now is absolutely flying. But he was challenged in, in completely different ways and he had a different perspective. So people had to understand what he was seeing and how he was visualising the game. Um, but one that sprung to mind immediately when you showed me the, the big fella in the picture in the middle was someone that, like Carwin Tupelotu. You know, he's now in Wales, in the Welsh um, game, but he was that kid. He was definitely that kid. He was bigger and stronger than everyone for three or four years. So it was how we got the best out of him to develop the all-round skills. But what he was, he, he, he turned out to just be, rugby aside, a beautiful boy that looked after everyone, cared for everyone. And having that sort of persona enabled him to grow on the pitch as well. So, Yeah, nice. Look, I think there's a couple of things that I would recommend to most people is, if you're going to use the word like talent, agree what you mean by it. Because I just hear words thrown about. He's talented. She isn't talented. She's talented type of stuff. And then also, what are your, what's your kind of end in mind stuff? So what is it that you're coaching that sits probably above the tech tech stuff that's really important? And, you know, if you watch some of the, <clears throat> any of the sport over the weekend, ultimately it'll come down to decision making under pressure. I mean, that's the reality. Um, and then probably the next bit for me is so um, 
So I'm, I'm interested in kind of big to game. So um, Rebecca, are you muted or unmuted? I'm I'm now unmuted. Cool. And so having looked you up a little bit, if I asked you to sing karaoke now, how would you feel about it? <laughs> You've done some research. Um, yeah, I'm not shy in front of a microphone, particularly when singing. I figured, I figured. Um, <laughs> uh, Duff, if I asked you to sing karaoke now, how would you be feeling about it? It'd have to be Westlife flying without wings or nothing. <laughs> um, it's deeply divvy. Um, are you, I mean, do you need a bit of practice or are you good to go? Me or Rebecca? No, 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 you, Duff. Rebecca's no too way. good. No, I need, I need a water, <laughs> some honey, hot water, honey, have a warm up. So, so look, my view with this stuff is like, um, and it definitely kind of fuels how I feel before a session. Like, I know it'll be a good session if I think. I'm about to sing karaoke and I'm not good. I'm on the Duff side of this equation, Rebecca. You'll be pleased to hear. Um, <laughs> and so I need to feel a bit nervous about this. Now, what I would say is with, with beat the game. So beat the game for me is about being tactically able to win games, understand how the opposition are, defeat them, um, solve problems. We need to think differently as coaches. So I met with a guy who's just started working in the Prem. He just messaged me and said, Rusty, can we go for a coffee and walk? And I said, yeah, yeah, of course can. I said, like, what, what are you thinking? I said, oh, he said, um, I thought this was going to be really easy. Well, he's a retired player. Of course he did. And um, I'm, I'm, I'm miles out of my depth. I actually haven't got a clue what I'm doing. I said, OK, well, let's talk about it. What's the stuff you're currently doing? So let's talk about how you design your practice. So, so pretty much no problem solving involved in it. And then let's talk about your behaviours. He said, Rusty, I run around telling people what to do and shouting at them uh, because that's what's happened to me for the last however number of years. So the reality is if we want to be like top left, so this is extra bath from a few years ago and have 24 players in a really small area of the pitch all looking at the ball, uh, putting their hand up because they don't want to take responsibility for anything. Uh, none of them are deep enough to run onto the ball and exit to the same or looking at the ball uh, then we can keep coaching how we're coaching if we want to coach differently and have tactical you know so it's no surprise to me that the youngsters are are tearing up in the premiership because their coaching doesn't look like top left doesn't create people who think or play like that then we need to think differently and here's a good example this is danks here Aaron danks coaching the england under 16s or 17s this is and in the room next door there's a group of players who are planning their match and this group are planning how to beat the opposition. Now, what I would say is a real simple thing for coaches to think about this is when you play a match at the weekend, you never have the same information as the opposition. They have a set of rules or plans or stuff that, that you don't know about. Now, you can have a guess at it if you have analysis and stuff. Of course you can but you don't exactly know what they're going to do and you don't know what they've done that week. What I would say is, and certainly the first 10 years of my coaching was, I was telling everyone the same information, but by telling some people different information, then then that for me is how you coach tactically. Um, a good example is pretty much every session I do of coach development, I'll tell, say, look, one of the teams, look, three or four of your team are going to walk for the next five minutes. The goal is that you're not seen by the opposition and you're not seen by the coaches who are watching. And quite frankly, no one ever sees that because they're not thinking about where are the weak links. They're not looking in front of them. They're playing like bath. They're getting into shape. They're looking at the ball. They're not looking at the information in front of them. So, so some of the stuff we've created around this, and I'm sure is something to think about a way to think about this is this actually so from a coaching point of view i'm often thinking about how can we break the rules and there'll be some rules around coaching one of the rules is coaches call huddles well surely it would be better to find out what the players know um if you were to have a rule around huddles that developed beat the game mindset then players would speak first players would speak last you would see what they've noticed before you told them anything you would see where they're at 
Um, telling everyone all the information for me is a rule of coaching. Um, you can have secret missions. You could tell two players in defence, your job today is to defend the opposite of everyone else and want to see if people, how people deal with it. That is going to help. Um, the work I'm doing with England at the moment, one of the challenges, in my opinion, is they talk about having their plan tested, is that some of the best teams in the world don't have their plan tested enough. So Exeter are experiencing that at the moment in the Premiership. They've lost two games on the bounce and you know their plans work till now and they've just not disrupted it enough themselves. So we created a load of <clears throat> kind of resources. I'm sure people have seen them and <clears throat> some stuff around um, rugby, some stuff here around cricket and much more uh, training around scenarios, around players. One team knowing some different information to the other team. You might have both teams have got a one-point way of scoring and a three-point way, and you've got to work out what it is. Uh, we, um, what, what's the stuff here that, that interests you, Duff, around this, or what have you what have you noticed? Uh, well, from using the cards, just from a personal point of view, it's allowed me to co-coach better. So actually, co-coaching for me has now become a real thing as opposed to head coach come up with a plan, everyone else sort of following behind. So uh, the bit that I've noticed is allowed me to connect with my coaches better. Nice. Yeah, look, so if we look at, let's take an example of this one. So, you know, play a 15-minute game, every scrum is a penalty to one team. So this one came about from the World Cup final. England, basically, every time there was a scrum, South Africa got the penalty. So how often have they ever had a training session where every scrum is a penalty? So you, you have to play differently. Mm. You actually, you might kick the ball down the pitch more. You might go, actually, we don't want possession as much. Um, you might take quick taps when there's a when there's a free kick or a penalty as opposed to calling a scrum, but you have to start thinking about that. The scrum challenge as well, so uh, scrum defence sets up and then cannot move. The attack then choose two defenders who must walk for the duration, so you've already picked the weak defenders and then it's your goal to try and work out who they are and score. And we've got a couple here, one's uh, from Tammy Beaumont and it's... Uh, uh, it's a scenario one and then another one against bowling against the tail. And for example, this has a bit where if you're a better batsman, you just use a stump instead of a bat to make it really hard for you. And it feel like you're a tail end of batman who bats person who doesn't have that much skill. So I'm sure this is stuff people are people are thinking about in their world. Uh, but that yeah. would be some of the big the game stuff I'm sure we'll, we'll talk about. It's also allowed me, Rusty, it's allowed me to stop dictating the game. So actually through practice and game, it's like what you said, you know, are we there to give them problems or solutions? Uh, and historically, going back to a few points time to, to your man who's just started coaching in the premiership is we coach how we've always been coached. So there's a script, everyone's on that script. But I love the fact that you alluded to, uh, and it's, correct me if I'm wrong, I, I don't know if I am, but it's the way I'll phrase it anyway. But the best example of sort of the new school way of coaching and the most exciting part of yesterday is, um, Prem rugby game was Marcus Smith and Tom Parton. So oh. you know they have they have been coached in the new model of coaching, if that's what we want to call it, and they set the game on fire. Yeah, Tom uh, Tom messaged me, so you can't put this out on social media. I, uh, he said, uh, "I said I enjoyed that." He said, "Me too." He said, "It it felt like uh, it felt like playing in the under 18s and that's what the game for me. I mean, and to be fair, this weekend, I think some teams realised they were falling behind in the league and they decided they, they would get rid of a lot of their, their structures and actually allow players to make decisions and there's there's some good young players. So look, that's probably a bit of a flavour of uh, of what we might cover. I'm definitely open to any kind of questions or stuff um, that, that, that people might have um, and, and chew the fat on it. Um, I don't know whether We've got any duffs or anyone can put anything in or unmute themselves. I'm. I um. <clears throat> I'm just going to see if there's actually any questions. Um. That have been shared in the chat. No, not yet. Um. Rebecca, what I would say to anyone that they might just be a bit sort of uh testing the water, seeing how how the feel of the um the webinar went. If there is any questions um, post 
uh, yeah. in this caption yeah. here. Just throw them on an email to, to Rusty and I, and we'll we'll mop it up on a on an email and send a a list of questions and answers out to everyone. So we'll, yeah, we'll no. Sorry, Rusty. Go on. We can do a video, Duff. If there's some questions, we can just answer some stuff. Cool. Yeah, and obviously today was just really a a taster um, for for some of the areas that, um, that Rusty and, and Jason will go into in more depth on the actual programme. So um, we'll have more information available um, on that soon. Um, I just wanted to say thanks to both of you. And what struck me uh, so clearly th throughout actually was how much of what you said applies actually to everyday life in terms of how, how we might teach well, but even how we might create strong positive relationships in life. I mean, take it away from, you know, we said it's not necessarily about rugby, it could be about sport in general, but for me it was actually about life in general. And we do a lot of work with the Institute of Education. We run the National Professional Development Qualification, so the MPQH, the middle leaders, the senior leaders, and so on. Um, and I deliver the facilitation training. So it's like train the train the trainer program about getting you know, senior leaders, heads, uh, principals to then facilitate these courses. And so much of that is around um, hootagogy. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with that term, hootagogy. It's basically about self-centered driving your own learning. So you're talking about getting the, the players to define when they want to take courses and how they want the game to be played out. And so it's a it's a concept of, of enhancing their own capacity and their own capability. It's called hootagogy. A lot of research done around that. And, and when, when we facilitate, that's what we say. These are adult learners we're working with and we want them to in a way discover their own learning as coaches or facilitators and those two are so similar actually we are really the catalyst for creating their growth so it, for me that there was some real um chords that struck struck with me about what you were saying about on a on a sports field or it's interesting uh, <clears throat> sorry Rebecca, but uh, i mean and, and true in business as well i mean all of this mm. stuff lots of uh demand for like people to understand coaching better in business as an example yeah. and environment and and one of the things we always get from the prem coaches is god it's awesome coaching jacob and margaret or marcus smith or tom partner well yeah because i you know still your i mean because they've been engaged in hootagogy you know they they are yeah. one in charge of their own learning they would have their own development plan they would be going look this is how you can help me with this coach as opposed to the other way around and I think we're we're starting to see a mindset shift in rugby. It's interesting. There'll be a lot of coaches that would laugh at the very thought of a of a kid rocking up with their own development plan. I think it would be criminal if that wasn't the case. I mean, and I'm mm. and I'm the same as you. I'm I'm talking about life. I think it would be helpful across all subjects. Yeah. You know, if all subjects thought like this and created curiosity and intrigue, and <clears throat> then. It's, the exam thing over here is absolutely fascinating me because we've got the whole look. There's some of postponed exams. IGCSE haven't yet. Lots of people up in arms. But actually, like education's about like mastery, and um, mm. people are pretty keen to. Uh, I mean, it it should be about mastery, and it's just become about passing a test, quite frankly. And yeah. uh, and that doesn't sit that well with me, if I'm brutally honest. Um, I'm not that bothered about like how many stiff bits I have or anything like that. I'm just thinking like, how can I just be the best I can possibly be at what I do? Rusty, that's that's about passion and, and you know a real sort of love for something. And I think that's something at the very beginning of of you and Fletch kicking off was the fact that people were misinterpreting what you were about. So I mean. We want people to love the game. We want people to love whatever sport they're in. We want people to love going to school and, and drive their own sort of learning around there and experience. I think probably where I'm going with this is that instead of just turning up to, to win a game, turning up to pass an exam, you, you develop someone to love being in and around that environment. But then by making it competitive and the passion to do well and the passion to excel, you know, is something that, is often misinterpreted for not wanting to win in. It doesn't matter about winning. You don't have to pass the exam, but it, to drive performance within that is really important. Um, like, and, I'm, and take this the right way, uh, Eddie Jones is the most closest to performance of any coach I work with. Like, he's number two in the world and 
he, he would he would be more likely to to take some information and adapt it so change his session plan change how they go coach than any other coach i've ever met that includes like the under sevens coach down at Augustonians. that includes any teacher i've ever met uh, i will actually get um it's a good example uh, it's a really good you know thing to think about is like how often do you deliberately make mistakes as a coach or a teacher so um i had a teacher at tunbridge and she said oh i started out and i wasn't that good and so i made it playful so i made five five or six mistakes every lesson and if they guessed them then they won a point if they didn't i won a point and at the end of the week there was a prize and she said and they really really and i'll take out the swear word they really 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 concentrated well of course they did so but we know that that helps helps learning and so i delivered at a school and, and and to be fair i don't often pull out the i did maths at cambridge card but i felt like <laughs> oh no <laughs> really but, but the maths department were going it's ridiculous who would make mistakes well i actually think it's a really good test of your culture if you know if people go oh hang on sir i think you made a mistake there so we would deliberately do that a lot i I shoot uh, still shooting economics and lots of kids who are too scared to put their hand up in a lesson because they don't have the ability to pause. So I had a friend who, you know, spoke about the pause. He put a pause on the a pause sign on his whiteboard. He went completely changed the dynamic of my lesson. But the kids have more responsibility. They are, and it's just much more dynamic lesson. We find out where they are, which bus stop they're at, instead of assuming they're all at the same bus stop. And I'm I'm a you know, I love helping kids with economics because the kids I'm helping generally, it's it's almost got to the stage where it's less about the economics and it's more about like you and how people have treated you and how can you go towards challenge and how can you get excited about learning. Um, oh man, we can talk all day. We won't. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to say, guys, um, just to, um, Tom, did you have a question? I, I, I think I saw your hand up earlier. I can't see it now. I think you can. Um, you're able to unmute um, yourself, I believe. Uh, or if not, maybe you could just type it into the chat box. Tom, yes, you're you're live. Go ahead. Um, yeah, I didn't. I didn't. I was just. I'm loving this idea of the pause button for um, the kids. Hey, Rusty, I haven't seen you for a long time, but how you doing? Um, <laughs> Yeah, just the idea of having the pause button at any point, love that. The, the elements I'm looking at, not just the top end of the school level, but I'm finding getting year three, year four, year five kids getting into rugby for the first time, just that engagement of the pass, catch pass situation without them swarming each other, that sort of thing. And it's more that level that I, I'm really keen to push forward. Yeah, look, and just a couple of things to think about. And I mean, I'm I'm obviously obsessed with the video game design stuff. It's changed my coaching significantly in the last three years. So uh, two things on that. One is like, you know, them them calling a timeout or a pause is, is really helpful. What I find with the younger kids is they call it every five seconds. Uh, what I find <laughs> with the older kids, I coached the, the men's 55 touch team, and it was like coaching a team of zombies. Like they could, <laughs> Pause. They couldn't think. There's nothing going on in their brains, um, and um, so I would just limit it. I might go. You've all got one pause a, a session, uh, but then with the passing stuff, for me, it's about finding out where people are. So having levels. So you move through the levels. So we all start on level one, or you can start on whichever level you want. And I see a real nice. And I, I won't give you a rugby example, but at Birmingham City, as the kids rock up, there's a a dustbin on the wall and a cone five yards away. A dustbin on the wall, cone ten yards away. There's a crossbar, there's a traffic cone on, on one end of it, and there's a water bottle on the other. So as the kids rock up and the kids you've got to do three keep you up east, level one. Level two, three keep you up east ten yards away, land the ball in the knock the traffic cone off. That's like ten minutes of practice. And they don't know they're doing it. People find their level, they get stuck on something, you know, or with the better players, you might say it's your non-dominant foot today. Um, so for me, that's what I see in, in rugby is like just, just as opposed to, you know, it might be excellent, it's a game and you just more overloaded attack, but 
Yeah, my preference is always to do it in a game, but it might be that it's a, a five on two game as an example where they'll do a lot of passing and they might, you know, yeah. passing. but you've also got to work out where each yeah, for definitely. Uh, I like that sort of that start to task. That's class. Sorry, sorry, Tom. I'm just very conscious of time. Um, as I say, this was um, a you know a little free webinar, a taster of of the course that we're putting together. Um, so I'm going to bring it to a close, if that's okay. And I'd like to say a massive thank you to Jason and to Rusty for their their time, their sharing their their knowledge and clearly their their passion uh, and their expertise. Um, and um you know i think if you're if you'd like to see a little bit more uh wait for the email to come out and there'll be some links to the um the details of that course and this webinar will also it's been recorded so um you can go back and watch that again and we've also got the um pdf powerpoint which we'll share with you as well um as the guy said if you've got any questions or anything that occurs to you afterwards um drop me an email and i'll forward that on to, on to, to jason and to, to rusty um, if you'd like any more information about training that we could offer um, as bespoke in-school training or for a club um, on that level, um, clearly it's not the same, you know, when we're not face to face, but as we all know now, a lot is possible online. Um, so do let us know if you've got any queries at all. Um, otherwise, a really big thank you once more to Rusty and Jason. Fascinating stuff. Thank you very much indeed. Thanks for jumping on, everyone. Yeah. Cheers, guys. Have a lovely evening. Thanks for joining us.